on World News Tonight. Greece burns. The wildfires continue to rage through Rhode Island with Greece calling for the largest evacuation effort in the country's history. New logo. Tech mogul Elon Musk unveils plans to replace Twitter's iconic Bluebird logo Larry to an end. Political limbo. Spain suffers the fate of the hung parliament after elections fails to indicate a clear winner. And a sushi deli delight. Cute pink sushi restaurant creates a splash in New York City. This is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening to you and you are watching World News this Monday night and we begin in tragedy struck northeast China as an infrastructure mishap left 11 people dead after the roof of the school gymnasium collapsed while it was being used by the girls volleyball team. At least 11 people are dead following the collapse of a middle school gymnasium roof in China's northeastern city of Kikihar. 19 people were at the gymnasium when the accident happened. Four escaped and 15 were trapped at the time, according to the municipal search and rescue headquarters. The final trapped person was found and pronounced dead, according to state media. Initial reports did not specify the ages of the victim, but at least one of the dead was identified as a student by state media. Investigation into the incident is ongoing. A preliminary investigation suggested the collapse may have been caused by misplaced construction material called perlite that was left on the gym roof during construction work on an adjacent building. Safety incidents are not uncommon in China and the accident follows a string of tragedies that have been linked to lax safety standards in recent months. Now over in Canada's east coast province of Nova Scotia where cleanup began after torrential rainfall caused devastating floods while the search continued for four people including two children who went missing during the deluge. The country has suffered the heaviest torrential rainfall in 40 years. Battered by devastating floods for days, Canada's east coast province of Nova Scotia began cleanup and repair efforts on Sunday while the search continued for four people missing, including two children that disappeared during the deluge. In the city of Halifax, authorities deployed a helicopter to rescue stranded victims. The weekend saw Nova Scotia hit by its heaviest rain in 40 years, brought by a storm that began on Friday. Up to 600 people were under evacuation orders. Roads, railways, bridges and buildings were badly damaged. Nova Scotia Premier Tim Houston. Uh, the main risks at this point are, of course, with our, our transportation challenges. We have approximately 25 bridges impacted across the province. 19 have been damaged. You know, investigations continue on that. But uh, six of those bridges were just completely destroyed. And it's incredible to see the force of the water and the impact it's had. We're working quickly, uh, as quickly as possible, to get our roads open. Houston said the cost of damage is certainly in the tens of millions and could even rack up to hundreds of millions of Canadian dollars. He added the province has applied for federal disaster assistance funds. Meanwhile, Indonesian authorities were searching for missing passengers after a ferry sank off Sulawesi Island. The National Search and Rescue Agency has stated that the ferry sinking has left at least 15 people dead. Rescue teams in Indonesia were searching on Monday for survivors of a ferry that sank off Sulawesi Island. At least 15 people are known to have been killed in the disaster, which happened shortly after midnight on Monday. The cause of the sinking is still unclear. The head of the search and rescue agency said that of the 40 people on board, 19 were still missing, while six had survived. Photos shared by the agency showed victims' bodies covered in cloth on the floor of the local hospital. Ferries are a common mode of transport in Indonesia, which has more than 17,000 islands. Accidents are common as lax safety standards often allow vessels to be overloaded without adequate life-saving equipment. Long days ahead for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as he revealed that he was doing excellently after surgery to fit a pacemaker ahead of a key parliamentarian vote on his controversial judicial overhaul plan, which triggered mass protests across the country. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a sudden announcement on Saturday that he had to be fitted with a pacemaker overnight. In a video statement, Netanyahu said, A week ago I was fitted with a monitoring device. That device beeped this evening and said I must receive a pacemaker and that I must do this tonight. The heart monitoring device was given to him after he was hospitalized overnight in mid-July for dehydration during a holiday to the Sea of Galilee amid a heat wave. In the video, the 73-year-old added, I feel great, but I need to listen to my doctors. Early on Sunday, his doctors at Sheba Medical Center said, quote, the implant went smoothly without any complications. Netanyahu had said in the video that his doctors assured him he would be discharged from the hospital by Sunday afternoon, in time for a key vote on a controversial bill to reform the judiciary. Netanyahu's statement came as protesters in Tel Aviv continued to put pressure on the government to scrap the judicial overhaul. We are here in order to try to save the democracy and to save Israel as uh, we used to have it. An estimated 100,000 Israelis packed out the streets of the business hub, as many have been doing every Saturday since early this year. Tens of thousands also converged on Jerusalem, rallying outside Parliament ahead of Sunday's debate on the bill that precedes the vote. Critics say the proposed changes will open the door to abuse of power. Netanyahu's religious nationalist coalition says the bill is needed to balance out the branches of power. The bid to change the judiciary has plunged Israel into one of its worst political crises, sparking ongoing nationwide protests, denting the economy and stirring concern among Western allies. A large wildfire tearing through the Greek island of Rhodes forced thousands of tourists to flee their hotels in what Greek officials said was the largest evacuation effort in the country's history. Those caught up in the blaze described chaotic and frightening scenes, with some having to leave on foot or find their own transport after being told to leave. Paradise on fire. Forests on the Greek island getaway of Rhodes blazed through the night on Sunday, leaving the sky glowing orange. Drone footage showed wildfires raising acres of ground in a disaster that has forced the evacuation of tens of thousands of tourists and locals. The Agros International Airport was seen earlier in the day crammed with people, many sleeping while they waited for news of rescue. Rhodes is a hugely popular holiday destination, particularly with visitors from Britain. Tourists told about the, quote, chaos that they'd witnessed. Basically, you could see the fire eventually on the uh, on the mountain top. Um, panic! Everyone dashing about, fleeing for buses. I don't know how many tourists there are in Faliroki, but evacuating that area, it's going to be impossible. Others had talked about walking for miles in scorching heat to reach safety, with footage from Saturday showing scores of people walking across beaches. Thousands reportedly also had to spend the night here and in the streets. Greece said the operation to get people to safety was the biggest of its kind in emergency conditions. The Greek Transport Ministry said TUI and JET2, which handle the bulk of tourism to Rhodes, planned 14 scheduled flights from Rhodes Airport, transferring around 2,700 passengers until 3 a.m. local time. Satellite images of Rhodes before and after the fires showed the extent of the blazes and the destruction they have wrought. Aerial footage released by the Turkish Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry showed aircraft helping fight the fires. Fires are common in Greece, but climate change has led to more extreme heat waves across southern Europe and many other parts of the world. Temperatures over the past week have exceeded 104 degrees Fahrenheit in many parts of Greece. In addition to roads, emergency services were dealing with fires across a series of other locations in Greece. Despite the evacuations, one government official said the fires on the island had largely been contained. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more World News. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now moving on to the tech frenzy, billionaire tech mogul Elon Musk announced that Twitter's new logo and X would go live replacing the distinctive bird logo in what would be the latest in a series of controversial shakeups to the social media platform under his stewardship. 
Elon Musk said on Sunday he was looking to change Twitter's logo. He tweeted, and soon we shall bid adieu to the Twitter brand, and gradually all the birds. In another post early on Sunday, the social media platform's billionaire owner added, if a good enough X logo is posted tonight, we'll make it go live worldwide tomorrow. And later in a Twitter Spaces chat, he replied yes when asked if the Twitter logo will change, adding that, quote, it should have been done a long time ago. Under Musk's tumultuous tenor since he bought Twitter in October, the company has changed its business name to X Corp. It reflects the billionaire's vision to create a super app like China's WeChat. The company did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Twitter's website says its logo, depicting a blue bird, is the company's most recognizable asset. More details emerge on the American soldier who defected to North Korea, indi indicating his defection was planned in advance. UN command is reportedly in talks with the regime over the matter. American soldier Travis King, who crossed the border to North Korea last Tuesday, had shown signs of discontent with army life almost a year before the incident. He had told military officials while on duty in South Korea last September that he would not return to post or America when questioned about his absence from duty. It has also been revealed that King was known to be a flight risk months before his defection last Tuesday. King had record of skipping out on his daily formation and leaving base. And in a leaked U.S. military serious incident report, the U.S. Defense Department said King was barred from leaving South Korea for three disciplinary incidents that occurred last year. King was detained for 47 days in a South Korean detention facility for those incidents before being released on July 10th. While the motive behind his defection remains unclear, U.S. officials added that he was facing military disciplinary action upon his return to the United States on a scheduled flight that he failed to board. This has sparked criticism within the military community that U.S. forces Korea should be held accountable for negligence, pointing out USFK's poor handling and monitoring of service members who break the law. But also called into question was processes at the United Nations Command, the UNC, where identification check procedures are carried out for all JSA tour groups. King had joined a full-day tour group, and the UNC's identification check procedures, which are conducted prior and through the tour, were unable to identify King as a potential problem. Meanwhile, spokesmen for the U.S.-led United Nations Command said contact with the North had been made through established hotlines. He said Private King's exact whereabouts are still unknown, but stressed that communication with the North is still ongoing. He refrained from giving further details on the matter, but did say that the primary topic of concern was the welfare of the U.S. soldier. But concerns remain as the incident occurred at a time of high tension on the Korean peninsula and while U.S.-North Korea relations remain frosty. Spain appears headed for a hung parliament after national elections left parties on the right and left without a clear path towards forging a new government. With 99% of votes counted, the conservative opposition People's Party had 136 seats, while Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez's ruling Socialist Workers' Party had 122 seats. With no single party winning enough parliamentary seats to form a government, prospects for coalition building now remain uncertain. The leaders of Spain's two main political parties, on opposite sides of the spectrum, both claimed victory on Sunday as a parliamentary election came to a nail-biting finish. But despite the revelry on the streets, Spain was in fact headed for a hung parliament. No party, nor likely political coalition, had won enough seats for a majority. With 99% of votes counted just before midnight, the Conservative People's Party had 136 seats, while Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez's ruling socialists had 122 seats. And the kingmaker parties that would have bolstered them were nearly even, with far-right Vox and far-left Sumar both clinching just above 30 seats. Previous polls had predicted a working majority for the right-wing bloc, but the election results instead paved the way for drawn-out and potentially fruitless talks to form a government. Fox leader Santiago Abascal called it a day of concern, saying his party had not achieved its objective to kick out Sanchez as prime minister. While Sumar's leader, Yolanda Diaz, said many Spaniards who worry about the far right taking over will be able to, quote, sleep calmly. With the highest vote count, 
People's Party leader Alberto Núñez Feijó will have the right to go first in trying to persuade smaller parties to back a coalition with Vox. But many appear reluctant to support the ascent of a far-right party into power after the four-decade dictatorship under Francisco Franco that ended in the 70s. Prime Minister Sánchez has more options for negotiations, but he would also likely struggle to cobble together a majority, with potential allies pushing for concessions in return for their support. New milestones in the future of travel and transportation as the world's first hydrogen power passenger train, Coradia Elint, is currently being tested in Canada's Quebec province. Conceived in France by rolling stock manufacturer Alstom, the hydrogen power train boasts of zero carbon emissions. It may be small, but this blue train has big plans to conquer America. The Coradia Island is the world's first passenger train powered by hydrogen. It's the first time it's rolling on the continent in Quebec's Charlevoix region. The technology allows for zero emissions. It was conceived in France. Germany purchased a version launched in 2018. At its base in Paul Terminus, the train is refueled with hydrogen produced in Quebec. It's a means for the province, which has invested $3 million in the project, to position itself as a leader in sustainable mobility in America. The train is only in its testing phase in North America to see what's needed to adapt it to existing infrastructure. But in Europe, Alstom says it has already received an order for 41 of its hydrogen trains. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The raging wildfire forced a new round of evacuations along a rural stretch of southern Washington state after burning more than 51,000 acres in three days. Authorities confirmed that the blaze, known as the Naval Road Fire, and is the largest in the Klickitak County history and is still 0% contained. New Zealand's Justice Minister resigned after being arrested in relation to a car crash the previous day, the fourth minister to quit the cabinet as many months in an engineer. Dominant Formula One leader Max Verstappen ran away with the Hungarian Grand Prix by a mighty margin as Red Bull made history with a record 12th victory in a row. Russia's Defense Ministry accused Ukraine of a terrorist drone attack on Moscow after city's mayor said the two buildings were hit and media reported that debris was found not far from the Defense Ministry's building. Palestinian Minister of Antiquity stated that the archaeologists working on the 2,000-year-old Roman cemetery discovered in Gaza last year have found at least 125 tombs, most with skeletons still largely intact, and two grand lid sarcophaguses. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end tonight with a look inside Shushi Delic, a pretty pink restaurant that introduces kawaii culture to New York. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.